Hello again everyone. Welcome back to the 2020 Great Basin National Park Bio Blitz. Again, my name is Amy Springer. I'm a graduate student at Utah State University and I will be your instructor for the suborder of Hemiptera called Acanarinca or the free living Hemipterans. This is part two of this three-part series and in this video I will be covering the first three families on our list. So to reorient you here, we're in order Hemiptera, which is the focus of this year's BioBlitz, and I am covering suborder Acanarinca, the free-living Hemipterans, and in this video I'm going to talk about the ecology and the identification characteristics of three families or superfamilies, superfamily Cercopoidea, family Cicadidae, and family Cicadelidae. So before we get to those three families, which is the focus of today's video, I want to go over just a little bit of anatomy that's going to be helpful and important for identifying these groups. First, the rostrum, which is the piercing sucking mouth part that all hemipterans share, is also found in um, Acanarinkins and in all of the following families. And a few other anatomical terms, the femur of a, an insect, just any insect, is the large, um, the large leg part that is very close to the body. It's not directly attached to the body, there's a few other parts in between, like the trochanter and the coxa, but those pieces are fairly small. In general, the biggest leg segment that you're going to see on an insect that's close to the body is going to be the femur. Um, the tibia is directly attached to the femur, and it's typically where you see sort of the knee joint on insects that bends in the direction you would expect a human knee to bend. That's going to be the connection between the femur and the tibia. And this holds true for all the legs, not just the hind legs, which is what I've shown here, but every single pair of legs on the insect, the front legs, mid legs, and hind legs, will have a femur and a tibia as well as tarsomeres, which are the last little segments down at the bottom of the foot. Um, the individual tarsomeres together make up what is called the tarsus, which is the foot of an insect. And finally, most of our hemipterans are going to have a claw, which is generally counted separately than the tarsomeres. So with that in mind, I'd like to move on to our first family, which is actually a superfamily, so one level above family, and that is superfamily Cercopoidea, or the frog hoppers and spittle bugs. So, frog hoppers and spittle bugs are really cool and they're fairly common. So, if you have ever walked along in a grassy meadow, maybe in the morning, and you have gotten froth on your leg and you said, oh, gross, and wiped it off, you've probably just found a spittle bug. And they feed on a wide range of plants. You can find them feeding on grasses, all the way up to feeding on pine trees and everything in between. Individual species may feed on just one type of plant, or they may feed on a ton of different types of plants. It really varies by the species. Some are generalists and some are highly specialized. And as I mentioned before, one of the really unique things about this family is they produce what is called spit, or froth. And this sort of frothy, soapy um, froth that they produce is a way that they protect themselves, specifically the nymphs, or the young of this family, protect themselves and keep in moisture and it provides a little bit of protection from predators. But the other reason why they produce this froth is because frog hoppers and spittle bugs are unique among the Ocanorhynchins and Hemipterans as a whole because they almost exclusively feed on xylem. So just to back up and refresh your plant anatomy, um, the xylem are the um, sort of veins that run through a plant that carry the low nutrient sap, mostly water-filled, 
carry that from the roots up to the leaves, whereas phloem are the nutrient-rich sap carriers that move sugars and other high nutrient molecules from the leaves where it was photosynthesized down into other non-photosynthetic non tissues. So while most hemipterans can feed on the phloem and they're getting a rich high um, calorie meal, the nymphs of cercopoids or the frog hoppers and spittle bugs they're drinking basically water. So they have to drink a lot of water to get the nutrients they need to survive. That's why basically these nymphs are plugged into the xylem, drinking this low nutrient sap, and they are just pushing water through their bodies all day long. And it has to go somewhere or else they would explode and thus they produce the froth. As a byproduct, basically. Finally, a really cool thing about frog hoppers and spittle bugs is that they jump really fast. Some can jump with an acceleration of over 4,000 meters per second squared. That produces a force of 500 or more Gs. Um, so 500 G means 500 times the force of gravity keeping you on Earth. So they're experiencing 500 times that amount of force. To put that into perspective, our fastest sports car, your Ferrari, your Porsche, they're only producing at maximum acceleration 1.7 G, or 1.7 times the force of gravity. So in a matchup between a frog hopper and a Ferrari, frog hopper wins. So how do I identify a frog hopper or a spittle bug? The key characters here are all in the legs. So frog hoppers and spittle bugs will have a rostrum, just like every other hemipteran. They're going to have the short bristle-like antennae, like other acanarhynchans. And uniquely to the cercopoideas, they're going to have a ring of crown-like spikes at the end of their tibiae. Tibiae is plural for tibia. They're also going to have only one or two sort of stout, short spikes along the length of their tibia here. They may also have a crown-like ring of spikes or spines on some of their tarsomeres as well. It's fairly common. I see that fairly often when I find um, cercopids in the wild. So to take a look at that on a real bug, here we have um, a grooved clypeus, which is not unique to cercopoids, but you will find them. Um, so sort of this, it looks sort of like the, the radiator of a car, um, similar to like what a cicada's face looks like. Here we have that beak arising near the back of the head rather than the front of the head, which is characteristic of a canarinkens. And here's those rings of spines on both the tibia and some of the tarsomeres along with one or two short, stiff spines along the tibia. So most of the frog hoppers and spittle bugs you'll find around here are kind of small. They're usually less than the size of your pinky fingernail, and they are kind of drab, usually browns, kind of tan colors. And of course, their nymphs or their young are found in bubbles of froth that they're producing from having to drink so much xylem every day. So I just want to show you guys because this is cool. Most of the time when people run into spittle bugs, they just run into the spittle and they never actually see the bug. So this is a spittle bug from Grand Tetons and it's a nymph, so it's just a little guy, a baby. And if I uh, harass him a little bit to get him to come out, this is what's inside. All of those little frothy uh, piles of spittle that you find on grass blades and other plants and meadows. So looks fairly similar to the adult little antennae. Um, no wings yet because it's just a baby. Moving on to the next family, 
I'd like to cover cicadity or the cicadas. And again, you can see that grill-like clippius or uh, lip, basically, on the insect that is characteristic of these first three families of Akenarinkins. A little bit of information about this family. The cicadas are large-bodied Akenarinkins. They are one of our largest Akenarinkins in general. While most of the Akenarinkins that I'm going to talk about during this lecture series are going to be less than the size of your pinky fingernail, cicadas are an exception. Most cicadas are going to be bigger than your thumbnail, and some of them are bigger than your entire thumb. They produce a loud drumming or buzzing sound with timbles, which are specialized organs on the side of their bodies. And um, they use their spear-like ovipositors to lay eggs under the bark of trees. So on this female here, you can see that big spear-like ovipositor. And this is not a stinger. It's harmless. The cicadas unless they're very, very confused, which I have never seen happen, they're not going to pierce you with their ovipositor. Another misconception about cicadas, they're not locusts. Some people call them locusts. They are not locusts and in general do very little harm to trees, even though their nymphs, after the eggs hatch, will drop down into the ground and feed on tree sap in the roots of the trees underground. They do very little damage in general in typical populations. So they're not locust, they're not in your fields, and they don't sting. They're completely harmless. A few other interesting things about cicadas, as I mentioned, they feed almost exclusively on tree sap, and while there are many annual species which you will find every year, um, there are a few periodical species which hatch only once every 13 or 17 years. They spend most of their life underground as a nymph feeding on tree sap, and they emerge, live for a few months, and die. And people get really excited about these uh, periodical cicadas because when they come out, they come out in huge numbers. And in fact, when periodical cicadas emerge, they are, for that period of time, the most abundant woodland herbivore both in number and in mass in the entire United States. That's pretty impressive. Um, and another note about the annual cicadas, um, they're called annual because you can find them every year. It does not mean that they only have a life cycle of one year. Some annual cicadas may stay underground for two years, even three years, it's just that all of their broods are staggered, so one of the brood is going to be reaching its final um, age, its third year or its second year, however long they live, every single year. So you'll always find them even though they may have a life cycle that's longer than a single year. So how do we identify cicadas? Well first, they're big and noisy. If you hear it, that big loud buzzing sound in the summer, it's probably a cicada, you don't even have to see it to know. But if you've got one in hand, cicadids have membranous wings, they're usually clear, and they have three large ocelli on the top of their head. Ocelli are simple eyes, they're not like your eyes, which can see, you know, objects and definition and um, shapes and depth. Ocelli can basically detect light and dark. They may play a role in circadian rhythms or determining seasons, um, but they really don't see anything in any definition. They can just tell, is it light, is it not light, and that's it. So cicadas actually have five eyes. Two big compound eyes for seeing like you and I see, and three little ocelli that can only tell light or dark. So to take a look at that on a real insect, here is a cicada, and those three little shiny dots are its ocelli, and every cicada will have those three ocelli. Finally, a note about how loud cicadas can be. This is an Australian green grocer. I'm sorry, you're probably not going to find it in Nevada unless something really strange has happened. but. Uh, this is one that I caught while I was in Australia, and some of the 
cicadas that produce sound not just to, to attract a mate, but also to basically aggravate their predators. In other words, some cicadas will buzz their tympanums, not, or their timbal, sorry, tympanum's not a grasshopper. Um, some cicadas will buzz their timbals really loud to annoy birds so that they get the tree to themselves. And it can be really annoying. Green grocer cicadas and other cicadas that do this, where they um, produce loud buzzing noises to deter predators, can produce sounds as loud as a chainsaw. So 120 decimals, decibels, to uh, put that in perspective for you, it, um, it breaks the pain threshold for human hearing. So if you are sitting next to a cicada like this, it's going to hurt your ears. And our final family today is going to be Cicadelidae, or the leafhoppers. This is one of my favorite groups in Akenarinka because they are often really colorful. So a few notes on their ecology and life history. They feed on a variety of plants. They're common in backyard lawns. If you've ever sat in the lawn in summer and you've seen a grass blade sort of tick to the side suddenly, um, that's usually cicadelids hopping around in the grass. Unlike cicadas, they only have two ocelli on the top of their head. They're occasionally agricultural pests, and in my opinion, they are some of the prettiest hemipterans. They can be extremely colorful and extremely brightly patterned, especially in the tropics, though you can find brightly patterned ones even in the United States up north here. Identifying cicadelids is fairly straightforward because their key characteristic is one or more rows of comb-like teeth lining the entire length of the hind tibiae. Unlike the cercopoids, which have just one or two spurs, the cicadelids will have rows upon rows of spines. So on an actual insect, that looks like this. Here you see these rows and rows of spines, and there's one of its two ocelli. And again, those little bristle-like antennae that are characteristic of almost all Akenarinkans. And finally, just a couple pictures, because they're so pretty. Most of the ones you're going to find in this area are going to be green or brown, but um, some of them you can find, especially in the genus Graphocephala, will have red stripes. So keep a lookout, they can be really bright, really beautiful little insects. Next time I will be covering our last three families, that's all I have for you today. So for the last three families of Akenarinkans that I'm going to cover, take a look at my next video.